what you're seeing in this section all the way to the end is breeding trials. Now, of course, in the middle field, we have a lot of breeding trials as well, but they're primarily disease trials, which for obvious reasons we keep over there. Um, but here in the south block, it's primarily um, breeding trials. And from the other end of the field where you see all the yellow flags, that's seedlings. So there's about 10,000 seedlings over there. Then second stage selections in larger plots. We have some full rows of various varieties here at the end. You can see some, some stakes. Um, but to my left here, where you see a stake in front of every individual plant, that's a genetic trial. So just kind of wanted to describe a little bit of the perspective of that for you. So um, strawberry being a clonally propagated crop that has a lot of implications for breeding and trialing. So when I first came here, one of my questions was when I'm trialing clones and I'm trying to have the most efficient experimental design for um, polygenic traits or traits that we would measure quantitatively, what do those trials need to look like? And um, one of the things I realized is that there's a group of people working with clonally propagated crops that have been working on this for a very, very long time, and they're called forest geneticists. In clonal forestry, they've been, because of the long generation time, they put lots of effort into very, very efficient trials. You know, just the right crossing structure with just the number, right number of, of, of units of replication. And, and a lot of what evolved from those over the years was that um, instead of having, you know, a few plots of, of, of plants, they actually do single plant replicates mostly in those trials because they tend to be the most efficient. And so that's actually what this trial was. It's basically imitating a forestry trial, clonal forestry trial. So Luis Osorio is a quantitative geneticist that started working with our program early on and he helped figure out a lot of these efficiencies. And so what we've come to is that if I'm testing, say, 500 advanced selections, what we do is we do five plants of each one, and we do single plant replicates. So there's a single plant replicate of 61105, for instance, and that'll be replicated five, uh, four other times. We, every week, take a field cart and computers and go through here and harvest every fruit and take a number of data on that fruit. Uh, we take bricks five times a year. At every harvest, we take the number of fruit, the weight of the fruit, uh, the cull categories of fruit and that kind of thing. And it's these trials that we use for genomic selection. So in your class, I talked about genomic selection. So when we um, generate our row column design here and we have some kind of adjusted clonal mean out of the trial, that's what goes into a genomic selection prediction model. And because all of these strawberries are highly related and a crossing structure, and we have pedigrees that go back 20 generations, um, we're able to leverage information across individuals. And that's why we can get away with doing so few plants per clone. It's because we're using information from relatives to tell us what the breeding value is. You're replicating is. alleles, you're not replicating. We're replicating alleles, not just clones, okay? So that's where a lot of the ideal design kind of comes from. So what we do is we, in these rows you can see from here down about 20 rows there, is this kind of trial that we harvest every week. And that means that all of the other trials become observational trials or disease resistance trials where we're gathering some other type of data. Right? So over there you can see larger plots. There's 10 plant plots over there. You can see the gaps are smaller between the, uh, the plants. Well, over there, that's where we're observing every one of these clones visually. And I find that having a plot of 10 plants allows me to do that pretty well as far as visually in the field. Those are not replicated because we get our replicated data here. Then we have those plots in another location farther north where we also walk those and observe them. So we've just found that we need only two locations because this is a very concentrated growing region. And there's really no G by E that we found between this location and the further north location. It's just that the other one has a little bit different soils, a little bit different humidity, gets a little colder than it does here. And when we're visually evaluating, it's helpful to look at those very subtle differences. But in terms of any significant G by E between those locations, there really isn't. This, this industry, there's 10,000 acres, acres of strawberry and it's mostly within 30 mile radius. So it's a very concentrated area. The variation that we have is really within a single season. So you really have to think about it differently. The locations aren't that different, but when we plant 
in late September, it's 90 degrees out here and humidity of almost 100%. By the middle of the winter, we have multiple freezes. Then at the end of the season, it gets hot again. We have periods where it gets rainy. Um, we, we have humidity fluctuating. We have the plants fluctuating in terms of their fruit load quite dramatically. So the crop changes so much and the weather changes so much across a single season that when we're looking at interactions and stability, we're really just looking at stability within seasons because there's more variation within a season than there is between seasons, if that makes sense. So what's really challenging I find in strawberry breeding is to select a variety that has really good yield and fruit quality from Thanksgiving all the way to Easter. Because if I just have a one week period in that whole time that my strawberry has a problem, it goes in the dumpster. As a breeder, the dumpster is your best friend. You've got to be really willing to get rid of things and, and, and put place selection intensity on your populations. And that's what makes strawberry um, both really fascinating and really hard, is that you have this seasonal variation. And then instead of having just a few traits, you have, say, 30 traits that we're interested in, multiple fruit quality traits, multiple shelf life and durability traits, flavor traits, sugars, acids, aroma, six different disease resistances that are important to us. Uh, the canopy of the bush is important in terms of harvesting efficiency, the length of the stem, the shape of the fruit, the external color of the fruit, the internal color of the fruit. And we can just go on and on and on. One thing is wrong, goes in the dumpster. So one out of about every 30,000 seedlings ever becomes a variety. Um, one out of 30,000 clones, that's, that's a pretty small percentage. Um, and it's because it's, it's so stringent. And as we're trying to beat the last variety, we just try to keep making these incremental, incremental changes, but we can't have a major weakness. When you have an industry that you've got to gross about $30,000 an acre to make profit, you're talking about a lot of risk. So if we're injecting risk with varieties, that's not good. The best variety is one that it may not necessarily be the best flavored or the highest yielding, but it has the fewest weaknesses across a 25 week, 30 week season, if that makes sense. So um, that's, that's kind of as a breeder, and as I'm walking through this every week, those are the kind of things that I think about. That's kind of what's in the back of my mind when I'm figuring out what's the ideal strawberry to select. So um, one of the important things you have to realize too is that we have about 200 million plants planted in this Florida industry every year. None of them come from Florida. These are the plants are all snowbirds. They spend the summer up in the uh, north, and they come down here for the winter. Less disease up in Canada or Northern California or the mountains of North Carolina, and some chilling and shorter days. We dig the plants in September, bring them down here, and then plant them, and they're ready to start flowering right away. We used to have a chill requirement to some degree on our varieties, but over the years we've almost eliminated that. Uh, when strawberry is, was sort of transitioned in the past decades from this perennial matted row type crop to something that's planted every year uh, and really doesn't get much cold before it, before it flowers and fruits. So it's a per, sort, sort of this natural perennial crop that's been transformed into an annualized crop in this raised bed culture. Why? Much higher yields on a per acre basis and much more control over the timing of the crop. Timing is important because right now the price